It was his biggest, boldest policy. When his shadow chancellor unveiled it, there was delight across the party. An additional £28 billion of capital investment in our country's green transition for each and every year of this decade. It was a former Labour leader's brainchild. The new leader embraced the pledge. Today, he retired it. We won't reach the £28 billion envisaged, um, and that, effect, that figure has effectively uh, stood down. Labour's green plan commitment had already shrunk from £28 billion every year of a parliament to £28 billion by the end of a parliament. We can ramp up to that £28 billion. Labour had already admitted its green plans weren't really 28, but 20 billion a year, as the government was already spending eight. Today, they shrank the commitment from 20 billion of new money to 4.7 billion a year. The reason for that is because since we announced the 28 billion, the Tories have done terrible damage to our economy, not just the Liz Truss um, budget, but also now the government briefing that it's going to max out on the government credit card. Reckless, but I have to anticipate the circumstances as they are now, not as I'd wish them to be. We know the Labour Party wants to go on a £28 billion green spending spree. The Tories claim their relentless accusations of reckless borrowing made Keir Starmer shrink the spending pledge. This was the flagship plank of Labour's economic policy and it now looks like he's trying to wriggle out of it. I think it demonstrates exactly what I've been saying, that he U-turns on major things, he can't say what he would do differently because he doesn't have a plan. From insulation on the plasterboard on top. The biggest casualty of Labour's shift is their plan to insulate 19 million homes over 10 years. That's now scaled back to 5 million homes by 2030. Some in the party say the leadership has caved in to its opponents. I say get strong. I say get strong and fight back. You know, that, that's the problem. You can't just sort of say, oh, well, I really believe this is the right thing to do, but I'm getting hammered for it, so I'm just going to back off. What you do is you go out there and you say, no, this is the right thing to do. Here's why I'm going to fight this. I'm going to tell the public why I believe in this. But if you, if, if you are always backing away from your policies, you look as if you don't actually believe in anything. Some in Labour used to compare their approach with Joe Biden's vast public spending boost. But now, Labour's much-reduced green policies sit alongside the flat government investment plans, which Labour's signed up to. Overall government plans are to cut investment spending really quite sharply over the next five years. And even had Labour kept to that £20 billion plan that it originally had, that would barely have been enough to keep investment spending overall at its current level, probably actually leading to it falling as a fraction of national income. So it sounded terribly big and generous, but uh, actually our investment uh, plans, those set out by the Chancellor, are for really quite, really quite significant cuts. And we now know Labour's plans are not that much different. In terms of their published plans, they don't look terribly different one from the other. Labour tonight boasted online that it was upping the windfall tax on the North Sea oil industry to help to pay for its remaining green investment. Borrowing now picks up £2.6 billion a year of the cost. Well, Keir Starmer is hoping that tonight he has shrunk the target on his back in an election year for the Tories to take aim at. But people inside the Labour Party are saying that uh, he may have shrunk his ambitions too. He's been insisting tonight that he hasn't done that, that his ambitions are exactly the same. The problem for him is that it's a, a matter of days, hours almost, since he was saying you needed that bigger figure the, that has now been discarded in order to meet targets like the 2030 uh, clean energy target. It's worth remembering that this whole policy owes itself to a different era, really. 2021, Labour was behind Boris Johnson in the polls. This was a policy that really cheered uh, people up, but Labour leadership just feels it is not wanted at this time. How have the leading protagonists in Labour coped with all of this? I think you have to think that Ed Miliband, well, he's still round the table, he's still there. This was his baby. He loved that policy. But he hopes that he's got enough, retained enough, in order to build on it at a, a later date. He comes out of this 
wounded but not too badly, Rachel Reeves has boosted her credentials as a shadow iron chancellor in waiting, even though she has been trimming a policy she connived in creating. It's Keir Starmer who looks a bit weakened by all of this, a bit pushed about. He's been angered behind the scenes by the leaks that have dominated this story and you can't help thinking he'll be trying to learn some lessons from it. Mm. Gary, thanks very much. Well, we did ask Labour for an interview about their policy change, but no one was available to talk to us. So what should we make of it? Here with me are our economics correspondent, Helia Ebrahimi, and in a minute, our chief correspondent, Alex Thompson, will be looking at the climate context. But first, Labour say they can't afford the plan anymore because of the state of the economy. So, Helia, does that stack up? Well, the plan's been radically resized, or as Gary said, shrunk, uh, and it now neatly fits within the fiscal rule to bring debt down within five years. That's something Rachel Reeves, as Gary said, has been very clear as a priority. By the way, it's the same rule that Jeremy Hunt sticks to. If we bring up the chart behind you and zoom in, you can see under the current spending plans, debt is falling uh, within five years. It's very small, though, just wafer thin, £13 billion of headroom, and that's the problem. Ah, wafer thin, as you say. Yeah, and that, if you look at the Green Pledge, it's gone from 28 billion to 4.7 billion. It's now a bit easier for the sums to add up, but Labour still need to find 24 billion within the next parliament. They say they're going to hike up the energy windfall tax. That gives them an extra 10.8 billion pounds, but they still need to borrow 12.9 billion pounds. Now, have a look at that quite neatly fits within that very wafer-thin headroom. The problem, Cathy, is that since 2010, the fiscal rules have been changed and tweaked by chancellors eight times, and that has really killed their credibility a little bit. And critics say all they do is create this doom loop of failed economics, where policies are simply chasing the rules rather than the economic need. So what can be done to break out of the doom loop? Well, we need growth, growth, growth. The problem is, where do you get it from? Now, in, in the industrial strategy from Labour last year, they said it was the Green Prosperity Plan that was going to deliver that growth. If you take that away, what do you have? Labour wants us to be the fastest growing economy in the G7. Well, we're currently second from last. And there's lots of talk about boosting the city and localism and universities, even doing Brexit better. But will they shift the needle enough. Well, Alex, let's turn to you for the climate context now, because of all of this, this U-turn came on the day when the EU Climate Service said it was the first time that global warming exceeded 1.5 degrees Celsius for an entire year. And under the Paris Agreement on Climate Change, world leaders promised to limit the long-term temperature rises to 1.5. So what do we make of this? Yeah, well, first of all, three graphics come up. I should warn viewers, three graphics that'll make them choke on their tea, I imagine. Two crumbs of optimism, and they're very small before we get into the graphics. One, nobody's talking about the three or four degrees Celsius rises because of the push and the takeoff of green technology. So that's true. Also, the physics projects that when we get to net zero, if we get there, global warming will slow down radically, of course. So graphic one, let's have a look at this. The familiar, I think, progress here, uh, year upon year, as they go left to right. And look at that, 2023, not just so much hotter, but Look at the difference there. OK, the previous two years, COVID affected, but it's right out there. So that's the global surface temperatures. Let's have a look now at sea temperatures. And this is truly alarming because you've got all the grey lines there of previous years. Then recent years, 2016, 15, look at 2023. Not just hotter, but way hotter. And then the little naughty worm there up at the left into February of this year, way, way hotter. It's not just burning uh, coal. Uh, oil and gas. It's El Nino, which is warming up Pacific waters. That will change. We don't know when, but it is mostly burning fossil fuels. Final one, just to have a look at the projections of sea ice, Antarctic sea ice, which of course cohere to the kind of trend that we've just seen there, uh, not where they should be. Now, this doesn't mean that the Paris goal of keeping temperatures lower than one or maximum 1.5 higher than pre-industrial records is lost, but it's hanging by a thread. We must act as we say often on this programme, is physics, not politics. Both political parties in this country retreating rather than implementing on green policies. Alex and Helia, thank you both very much for all of that context. 
Well, now, the controversy over a supposed joke that Rishi Sunak made about transgender people during Prime Minister's questions yesterday shows no sign of subsiding. The Prime Minister had made a dig about Labour's definition of a woman, despite being told that the mother of murdered trans teenager Brianna Jai was watching from the gallery. Her father called on Rishi Sunak to apologise for the remarks. But speaking today in Cornwall, the Prime Minister blamed the Labour leader for politicising Brianna Jai's death. I have nothing but the most heartfelt sympathy for her entire family and, and friends. You know, but to use that tragedy to detract from the very separate and clear point I was making about Keir Starmer's proven track record of multiple U-turns on major policies because he doesn't have a plan, I think is both sad and wrong. Well, speaking of U-turns, the Labour Party are not the only ones accused of watering down their green commitments in recent months. In January, climate czar and former energy minister Chris Skidmore resigned as Conservative MP for Kingswood in protest over the government's net zero strategy and its plans to drill for more North Sea oil and gas. Earlier, I sat down with him and began by asking for his response to Labour's rollback on their £28 billion pledge. Having the long-term commitment is just as important as the money. And I would say, actually, we've ended up in a, a bit of a false narrative around the £28 billion. Yes, we do need the money, but the money is not the most important thing. It's about that long-term commitment over a decade and beyond to actually developing and deciding that this is the future. And that also will unlock investment, private investment, that we need. So I would say stay the course, even if the money is not there... The fact that actually the commitment to projects, to outcomes, that's what we need to see. Right, so the insulating 19 million exactly. homes, for example, as long as they do those individual projects, you're not so bothered about the 28 billion a year figure. What I think we need to see is parties coming forward to say, in the next five years, we will make your life as a householder better by delivering on certain outcomes, so that by 2030, people can see the change. The, there's a net zero uh, emissions target in place for 2050, almost halving emissions by 2030. Are those targets now in jeopardy? Well, I mean, in the UK, we have, you know, successfully halved our emissions already. We are a leader, and what I've always said is we could do so much more to demonstrate to, to other countries. If the UK decides to go slow because we've got to where we need to be in halving our emissions, what's to say other countries might not then say, well, you know, the UK's opened up new oil fields, we'll do the same. But the it's... government would say, well, if we're already meeting our targets, we can ease off a little bit and help people, you know, who are being hit hard in the po pocket by the cost of living crisis. Well, no, because our targets are still 68% emissions reduction by 2030, 78 emissions reduction by 2035. You can't necessarily ease off because it's not just about tackling emissions reduction, the climate crisis. The rest of the world has woken up to the opportunities that Net Zero provides. As we speak, there are boardroom decisions being made across the world about where to place investment. I want that investment in clean, green technologies to come to the UK, but it will probably go to the United States, it will probably go to Europe, it goes to Asia. We're so Britain's a, now a laggard in this industry. We're in a net zero race. We're not just in a race against time to tackle climate change, we're in a race against time to maintain our economy to be fit for the future. And that's what this is about. This and is the prize. based on both what Labour said today and what your party has been saying for a little while, we are now losing that race. Absolutely. If you look at the states, that's 370 billion pounds worth of investment. If you look at the EU, that's a, a trillion euros worth of investment by 2030. If we don't step up, we'll have to stand down and we will lose traction, we will lose jobs, we will lose growth and ultimately we'll lose our place in the world as one of the leading economies. So are you disappointed then by the response from some of your colleagues about your resignation, which you said was on a matter of principle? I mean, one of your colleagues, Dudley North MP Marco Longhi, for example, said Chris has long been an MP who put net zero dogma ahead of working class people being forced to pay for it all. Perhaps Chris can focus even more on his outside interests. What do you make of that? Well, Mario was elected in 2019, but he was elected on a manifesto that had net zero on its front page. Um, the reality is, as the Conservative Party signed net zero into law, we have led as a party in demonstrating the economic opportunity. You know, we've halved our emissions, but we've grown our economy by 70%. You know, I want Mario's constituents to benefit from the energy transition. I want Mario's constituents to have clean, renewable power and not be vulnerable to foreign fossil prices. And I'm not some kind of net zero eco-zealot. Eco well, you, you do earn a tidy sum from consultancy work for the green industry, though, don't you? Well, I have, in the past, you know, worked along a number of sectors, but it's nothing compared to a vast number of my colleagues that are working for GB News, for example. Jacob Rees-Mogg is earning, I think, £500,000. The deputy chairman of the Tory party was earning £100,000. You know, and I have only sought to decarbonise and reduce our emissions. It's something I'm committed to for the rest of my career. You 
talked about how this has become a kind of culture wars issue. We saw the culture war raging at Prime Minister's questions yesterday when Rishi Sunak appeared to mock trans people. Brianna Jai's mother was uh, in the chamber yesterday. Do you think he should apologise to her parents? So I think it's important to say I'm not you know, a conservative anymore. I'm an independent. I resigned the conservative whip. I think if I was sitting you know, behind the prime minister and prime minister's questions, obviously I would have been mortally uh, embarrassed at what happened and ashamed. I think this is the consequences of a culture war of which no one wins. This sort of race to the bottom, trying to go after the lowest common denominator. It's not what people want. People want hope. They want a positive vision of the future. It's why people need to know that parties stand for something, not just about what they stand against. Attacking minorities is not the way forward to build political consensus. It's certainly not the way forward about showing leadership. So, of course, you know, he should apologise. And I think this scenario is only going to get worse if that apology doesn't come. Chris Gibmore, thanks very much. Thank you.